Mike Hatko. Please welcome Munjit Singh, Vice President and Immersive Computing Lead at Booz Allen Hamilton. Good afternoon, everyone. You guys hear me okay? Audio good? Good. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about uh, the current state of immersive technologies. Um, we're also going to talk about where we think it's going to be going in the future. Uh, today, we really wanted to have kind of a focus and an emphasis on the enterprise use cases. And when we talk about enterprise, we're not just going to restrict it to public sector or private sector. We're going to explore you know, the whole spectrum um, when it comes to corporations who are looking for new ways to collaborate um, and engage with their geographic dispersed teams using these technologies, all the way to um, our warfighters who uh, are demanding better training solutions and uh, more immersive training solutions. So to accomplish that, I've got a uh, very esteemed panel that is joining us really from across the country. Uh, starting to my left here, uh, we have um, Amber Osborne from uh, Doghead Software. She is a chief marketing officer. Uh, Doghead is doing some really impressive uh, things with immersive technologies in some of their suites, and uh, really looking forward to digging into that today. And Amber is also joining us from the number one innovation hotbed uh, in the country as far as AR, VR is concerned, out of Seattle, Washington. So thank you for making the trip over. Yeah, thank you. Uh, next to Amber, we have Mr. Tony Cherry, who is uh, recently retired, so make sure you congratulate him, or if you, <laughs> if you see him around the city later today, maybe buy him a drink. Uh, Tony, um, well, uh, today, you know, probably most what's on his mind is home improvement projects, vacations, and uh, which golf course to hit next. Uh, as recently as two months ago, was uh, the director of games and simulations at uh, the Army Training and Doctorate Command, uh, better known as TRADOC. And so Tony will be talking about some of the work that our warfighters are doing, the Army in particular, DOD, and how they're starting to adopt these technologies, what the potential looks like in that regard. Um, and then last but certainly not least, we have Lucian Parsons. Lucian is joining us from the University of Maryland. Uh, for those of you who are not from the area, I think there's two things you need to know about UMD. Number one, they are a top 10 computer science school nationwide and uh, very well recognized in that regard. And then they also are one of the um, universities that's investing the heaviest in immersive technologies. Lucian actually leads up the Mixed Augmented Virtual Reality Innovation Center. Uh, if that's hard to remember, he's come up with a really awesome acronym called Maverick. So, um, and he has a really good conference coming up in the next few weeks, which we'll talk about as well. Thanks, so, Thank you all for joining us today. Um, so we wanted to talk about the current state of immersive and you know, where we think it's going. And, and as I mentioned before, you know, there is a lot of focus on how these technologies are starting to disrupt the consumer markets and just multiple verticals, whether it's the gaming industry, entertainment. You know, in some cases, we're seeing that disruption take place. In some cases, we're seeing the industry really poised um, to take that on. We really wanted to talk about kind of the enterprise use cases as well, because we are seeing a, a hotbed of activity in that space right now. And, and frankly, I think it's something that is often overlooked um, in the national media when it comes to the adoption of these technologies. But it's important, I think, to capture the state of it, just because you know, the last uh, six months, we've seen um, some really amazing things take place, particularly in the, the headset space. We've seen the introduction of um, you know, wireless headsets that have the capability to do tracking all integrated inside the headset itself wireless display capabilities. The reason I bring this up is you know, when we're talking about enterprise use cases, when it comes to our clients, whether they're in government or whether they're in industry, there are barriers of adoption that they've identified. Some big ones are like the form factor. You know, it's too bulky. It's awkward. They don't like the cable that's being strung up to the computer to handle the GPU you know, streaming display. Um, and so, you know, so far, we've seen Oculus slash Facebook release uh, the Oculus Go which is a really targeting kind of the low-end um, VR, low-end to mid-tier VR. And then they also released one kind of the opposite end of the spectrum called the Oculus Quest. Uh, again, wireless display, what we call inside-out tracking, the ability to do spatial computing, identify where you are, where the controllers are, you know, and what room you're in and where the physical you know, boundaries and objects are that the headset and you need to be aware of as you're going through these experiences. And um, the Oculus Quest has got the capability to do arena scale tracking now, which is really exciting. So we're starting to see a lot of these you know, identified barriers of adoption start to break down. 
Um, we also saw HTC release the Vive Pro. That was about six months ago. Um, and this is really an ultra high-end you know, headset, really targeted at the enterprise. It's got a price tag uh, commensurate with their, I think, addressable market. But the display is um, really fantastic, integrated audio, um, not quite wireless tracking yet, but um, I think that we're expecting some big things out of HTC in the future as well. And then one of the most um, uh, exciting things for me, and it's admittedly kind of a boring topic, is Microsoft with their HoloLens 2 has announced that it's going to have some of the enterprise features that we need um, inside the enterprise baked into it. Things like security controls, mobile device management, identification, you know, identity and authentication management, stuff like that. Um, one of the biggest announcements, though, is that it'll have an onboard neural network accelerator. And what that means is that the HoloLens will be able to accomplish some basic AI capabilities to enrich the experience and really help with things like object identification and some of the onboard functionality that it has. Um, and so uh, we are going to be talking today about the intersect of artificial intelligence and immersive and what that means for the enterprise, because we are starting to see the industry really poise um, for that convergence. And then, of course, it would be remiss if we didn't mention Magic Leap, uh, who released their headset. I think all of us have received one or are about to receive one. Um, reviews are coming in, kind of mixed, but um, I think there's a lot of promise there, um, especially for uh, some of the enterprise use cases that we've been talking about. So I'm actually going to start with Lucian. Uh, you know, we talked about just what we've seen in the last six months. That was a lot. And um, it is a very dizzying and at times overwhelming space for those of us who are watching it pretty closely. Can you give us kind of a, a brief history of time of you know, how we arrived at this point um, you know, and really what has kind of led us along this path on the immersive? Sure. So th that was a great technical um synopsis of where we are and uh, at this current moment. I think it's important to step back a little bit when we're talking about what does it actually mean? What does this technology give us? Um, and we're currently in kind of the third wave of, hey, VR is the future. Um, the first wave, late 80s, early 90s, second one, late 90s. Um, arguably, you could go back to the 70s uh, for the first one if you wanted to. Um, but what happened in the early 90s um, is we had this idea, oh, hey, it's a 3D world, and we're doing everything on these flat screens. That doesn't make sense. We have finally have the technology to take it off of a flat screen. But everything we did back at that point was custom built. Custom built hardware, custom built software. Nobody actually had been programming in 3D, really. And so when we tried to build something in that environment, we were talking about $200 million projects. Um, well, if you've got a $200 million project, you need a, at least a $300 million problem in order to get any sort of ROI. So what did we get? We got flight simulators for, for the Navy and the, and the Air Force and the Army, et cetera. Because if you crash a plane and you kill a bunch of people, that's a, that's a several hundred million dollar problem, uh, especially if you start crashing more than one. Um, and then the next wave, about 10 years ago, the cost started dropping uh, rapidly. And the cost dropped because the technology was better. But there was still no standard platform, and there was still no standard hardware. Um, and so then we're looking at a $20 million um, kind of effort to get something meaningful in VR. And we're now at the point where we've dropped another order of magnitude. And, and for just a couple of million dollars, and I say that just a couple of million, <laughs> um, you, can, you can create something meaningful. And the path we're on, though, now that we have a couple of kind of standardized hardware platforms, we have some standardized software, and we've also got a whole generation of programmers and creators who've been doing this for the last 20 years, mostly in video games, but in, uh, also in simulation and training. Um, and, and so that's just going to keep going down. And soon we're going to be in the sub-million dollar range. And at a sub-million dollar, that opens up an enormous range of possibilities for what you can create effectively and with, with positive ROI compared to what we had before. Um, and it also opens up the playing field, because when you needed a $100 million lab, or you had to be in Silicon Valley or Seattle, no, no offense, in order to make these things happen, then that limited the pool, naturally. And 
Uh, you mentioned the Maverick Conference in two weeks. We've got 40 local companies, including our host Booz Allen, showing off some of their stuff that's, uh, that's going to happen, that's being built here in this region. And so now, with the government, with some of the corporations, we can put, people can be building this where the people using it are. Um, and that's going to make an enormous difference as well. So I just see, I see a, a huge opening up of possibilities because of these trends. That's awesome. Yeah, I think um, a couple of themes there, right? You know, there's been kind of this drastic cost reduction that we've seen and, you know, higher ROI. I mean, some of these headsets that we're dealing with now were like $50,000 just yeah. six or seven years ago. Um, so, Tony, one of the questions I had for you, I mean, Lucian hit on kind of the decreasing costs. He also hit on, you know, some of the complex simulators that the military has used in the past and leveling out the playing field in the spirit of that, it seems like these commoditized technologies are opening up new opportunities in the military space. Can you chat about you know, what, you th what your personal thoughts are on the applicability of these technologies for the purposes of training and simulation in the DoD? Sure, and I would say that DoD, Department of Defense, is probably one of the most fertile environments for this that exists any place in the world. Historically, Back to 1922, our first simulator was made by a guy by the name of Link, uh, Mr. Link, and it was, his company came from organs, and they knew bellows, and they knew how to make things move, and he put that into an airplane trainer, uh, and then came World War II. Uh, at the end of World War II, the Royal Air Force Chief of Staff said, quote, the Luftwaffe met its Waterloo on the training, free, training fields of the free world where there were batteries of link trainers. So that's our history as far as immersive or virtual, whatever. You go today and we talked about crashing airplanes. Uh, the, the simulators, they, they make you sweat. You, you are afraid of making a mistake because you're going to crash your airplane, but you're virtual. Uh, you don't want to get shot at because it could kill you if you're in, in, in squad combat, or right? you can be underwater in special operations. And some of the things they do uh, scare me sometimes uh, with the fidelity, uh, or gunships uh, where a US AC-130 crew can be virtually linked with an Australian group and bring fire one uh, enemy in Afghanistan. All virtually, all, all heads, it's great. Uh, the Navy, their uh, CIs, it goes on and on. Uh, incredibly fertile due to the nature of the business. We can crash airplanes all day long. We can be killed all day long. We can not get our regulator. We can sink our ship. That's one of the beautiful things about uh, AR and VR and DOD. Awesome. I think we're starting to see a lot of uh, headway in that space as well. Um, you know, what's interesting is that Education using these technologies kind of takes on, um, you know, different different uh, capabilities and manifests itself in different ways. Amber, you guys are exploring kind of a, a different use case, more focused on collaboration and higher education using your software. Can you kind of chat about that space? And yeah, some of your uh, I would love to. Um, so uh, our software, Rumi, uh, Rumi VR. Uh, we have essentially a, a meeting space. So you can have a, a meeting space in virtual reality. You can even have your meeting rooms, your lobbies customized for, say, even like this tent. We could have this conference in virtual reality. So um, yeah, there's so many different opportunities in education, especially a higher education. And we use a lot of 3D models. Mm -hmm. So that way that you can visualize having a airplane right in front of you. You can pull off expensive parts that if you made it in, you know, in a, a real model, it would be extremely time consuming and extremely expensive, where then you can go and collaborate. I really believe that instead of video conferencing, that this is going to be the future of how we communicate and how we work. Also, because when you're in virtual reality, you know, you're not seeing what's behind you on the video screen. So if you have sensitive information, say papers on a desk or, or anything on a whiteboard, you're not going to be able to see that in VR, where video conferencing, you know, you do have that risk. 
So it's kind of an interesting anecdote. I was, admittedly, I was a little skeptical when I heard about <laughs> Doghead and, and Rumi, but uh, just last week we held um, our first all hands um, all in VR. And we had about 30 people from the team um, all inside this virtual space. We did our, you know, celebrated the anniversaries, big awards. We even imported a 3D model of uh, some uh, VR work that we're doing for one of our clients. And everybody was able to kind of walk around the 3D model, look at it from different angles, offer critiques and, you know, suggestions on improvements, ask questions. We could animate the 3D model. Very, very powerful. So I did, definitely Did you agree. get to high five? That's yes, my favorite did. part. Okay. Yes. That's yeah, awesome. High fives and all the emojis built in. Yeah. Customize my little avatar. It, awesome. was, it was fantastic. Perfect. Um, all right, good. So uh, you guys have kind of a sense now at how each one of our panelists approach this industry. I think we wanted to get into some of the exciting topics that are, um, that are happening now or that are starting to unfold. And one of them is the one you know, I mentioned earlier around the convergence of artificial intelligence and immersive. And you know, I think there's a lot of um, confusion when we're talking about this topic, uh, and mostly because both technologies, you know, they're at right around the peak of the quote, you know, Gardner hype cycle, and so there's a lot of information out there, some good information, some misinformation. I think for the purposes of this topic, you know, we'll just talk about artificial intelligence as the ability for a machine or an algorithm to infer information based off data that it's provided the same way that a human might without necessarily having a human in the loop or without having the need to have a human in the loop. And really one of the tools that I think we are excited about in this space is um, machine learning and deep learning. And you know, that is one of the, uh, the tool sets that we use to write these algorithms, to train them, um, and to help inform them. And so, uh, you know, like Lucian, when we're starting to talk about um, this area of uh, AI and immersive, you know, coming together. Kind of curious what your thoughts are there. You know, have you seen, are you starting to see the design patterns that you expected to see? Are you starting to see that uh, there's some promise there? What's your kind of... Well, I think it, one, of the, one of the really interesting things about being in this space right now is we haven't, although we have a nice background and, and kind of capability set built, there's still not a a standard user interface. There's not a way that we know we're going to use it yet. Um, and there's not a way to use it yet. Um, and, and so that, that's tough. It makes it hard to do some things, but it also kind of opens up the possibility space. And I think the AI piece of it is going to be really important to, because it turns out that Saying everything you want to say is kind of hard. If you've tried to order something using only your voice, and there's like 15 different sizes, and there's three different brands, and there's five different levels, and, there's, and you have to spend a lot of time. And I think as we integrate AI into this augmented world that we're living in, and I'm including natural language processing as an augmented technology. Um, it doesn't have to be visual, although visual will be, will be really important. Um, it's going to start taking it from a demand-driven thing of, oh, I need to know this thing, or I need to go do this thing. Let me pull out my supercomputer in my pocket or purse and, and go ask for it to, oh, well, I'm in this situation. The camera on my glasses or wherever it is recognizes the situation, or maybe it's based off of location, and it starts proactively pushing information to me. Um, and so this offboarding of, of the human memory that started with the smartphone, it, well, arguably earlier, but it has really accelerated, um, has, a, has an opportunity to take another step. And as we get a better user interface if we understand how people need this information. And we can use AI to kind of deliver that information in the moment. Uh, we're going to have a, a phenomenal increase in human productivity. Because personally, I am very interested in the human in the loop yeah. part of this. Um, the AI on its own, the machine learning on its own, um, some really interesting things out there, but it's, it's how can we augment the capabilities of people and, and really create superhuman capabilities uh, that are, are where the near-term future certainly is and where I also think we should be spending a lot of time. That's certainly what we're spending time on at Maverick. Yeah, 
Yeah, so the, uh, the Air Force actually has a really great example of just that right now. Uh, they're currently working in partnership with HCC Vive on figuring out how they can train um, pilots and do it in a safer way, uh, a more efficient way, and a less expensive way. Uh, so they're using AI t in virtual reality environments to monitor heart rate. Mm -hmm. So if the heart rate is faster, then they know then to program for a different kind of training module, um, as well as it will change the environments, uh, judging on different reactions that the human has. Um, I'm not sure if they're using any kind of haptics for that, but I think it's just uh, eye, mm -hmm. <clears throat> eye monitoring and tracking in the headsets, as well as heart rate monitoring. So there's, there's a lot of AI being built into um, <clears throat> military-focused software and also training software. Um, but currently, as a, on a consumer level, you know, there, are, there are workout and fitness programs that you can get through uh, VR that mm -hmm. have that kind of simple, more simple AI technology in it. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting you hit on, you know, another big trend that we're starting to see, and that's the ability to, um, you know, have instrumentation built into the headsets and collect data about the user. And, you know, when I say data about the user, it's really, like, where is the user looking? You know, if you take about a military training application, are they looking downrange? Are they looking at their short-range targets? You know, eye tracking, things like that, really to gauge the efficacy of training and you know, how effective the simulation is. Um, Tony, this is an area that the US military has been looking at for a number of years. When you start to talk about these data streams, either natively from the headset or augmented with sensors, the way Amber was describing, um, what kind of possibilities does that open up when you start to inject these new tech in, uh, into it? Yeah, uh, I really had probably the best job in the whole army. One of my branches was gaming and simulation, and another one of my branches was data science and AI. It was kind of a different directorate, so I got a chance to think through or try and meld the two of them. So I am beside myself with where we're at right now and the potential for where we're going. You've heard it here at the conference, by the way, depending on what sessions that you've been in. So Susan Kelwhite from the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency the other day said something in, in session here that we've been trying to push. She said the data ought to come find the person with the need. You said, dial up what you need. What she's saying, what I believe, is the data comes finds you. Why not? Um, and then the lady from uh, Intel this morning, a Ada, I forget her last name, uh, she was talking about 5G. OK, now's the time. It's going to happen. I, you can start to see it. So uh, again, back on uh, history. This is the 25th year from Mogadishu, Black Hawk down, et cetera, et cetera. Imagine if those pilots had had the kind of immersive or heads up or AI driven displays, what could have happened? As we take a look back, everything that they experienced, all the things that they were responding to could have been captured with either sensors and fed back into an algorithm that gave them a different answer or different altitude out and, and how to to maneuver. Uh, we're starting to see that now in, uh, for example, the Army's uh, squad, soldier, virtual trainer, SSVT, where they're physically saying that we want to get some of that AI stuff and we want to put it into the VR stuff and it'll be good. Yeah. These are generals talking. That's the way they talk. Uh, <laughs> they've got some really good engineers that are, are making it happen. Uh, one final thing that's got me all excited right now is uh, General Mattis, uh, the, the DepSec Def. Um, he is not a technologist. God love him. He does a lot of things good. He's not a technologist. But he knows that this training and this AI is, is here now. And he has put a mandate out that is driving a lot of what's happening. His goal is to fight 25 bloodless battles before you do it for real. And that's the way DOD is starting to move. So it's very exciting intersection of technologies because we have to go faster and AI and data science is going to help the VR and AR guys get there. It's interesting because, you know, in previous uh, technologies that we've seen emerging, the US military and DOD have always been a few clicks back, right? They've, they've waited for those technologies to mature and kind of harden in the enterprise space and the consumer space. 
and then they've adopted them. But with Immersive, we're actually seeing the DoD be one of the fastest um, adopters of these technologies, probably only you know right behind the consumer space. Um, so it is it is fascinating. So with that, let's and let's, much more effectively. Yes, than the uh, consumer space. I it? agree. Yep. <laughs> Um, so let's explore kind of the future a little bit. I'm curious for each one of you, you know, there, we have a vast realm of possibilities in front of us when it comes to AR, VR, and at some point XR and, and mixed. Um, I'm curious when we talk about kind of the future looking, you know, possibilities, either, you know, opportunities of where this technology could go, peripherals that could be added, um, or what types of challenges you guys are concerned about. I'm just kind of curious what's top of mind. And Amber, yeah. if it's OK, we'll start with you. Awesome. Um, yeah. So has anybody seen Ready Player One, the sure. movie? <laughs> so you remember when he puts on the suit? That's essentially, it's called a haptic suit. So you can, you can feel. Um, that was set, I believe, in 2025 or so. Um, we already pretty much have that technology now. Uh, there's a company that's called Haptics, like Haptx, uh, that just yesterday announced their Haptics gloves, which I got to try out. And I got to tell you, it is an experience. Because we're, even working in VR and working with so much technology, you have those wow moments. And that was definitely a wow moment. So you put on these haptic gloves. And inside the gloves, they have pressure sensors. And he explains it beautifully, um, so you can ask him later. <laughs> but they have pressure sensors. So when you're in a VR headset, you can go and like, grab a, a cloud. And you can feel the cloud. You can squish the cloud. You can feel the weight of the cloud. And um, they also, you can uh, feel temperature. So, uh, they have a demonstration of an ice cube, and you can feel temperature as well as fire. And where this comes in handy, especially with any kind of um, military use cases, is they, I believe there's firefighters right now that are training on it, and they can test for temperature. You go and grab a door handle, they can feel that heat in the door handle. So there's a lot of just amazing haptic technologies that are coming out that I believe you know, is the future is now with, with that kind of technology. Yep. Um, of course, it is very expensive. Um, haptics yesterday, if you're a developer, they released dev kits. So if you want to try it out, uh, go ask them. But I think the biggest barrier to entry is the expense right now yep. of, of the products. And on a consumer level, I mean, I just tell everybody, get out and go try VR if you haven't. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of VR arcades. There's one in DC right down the road that they have Mario Kart VR, which is awesome. Um, <laughs> And yeah, go out and go and experience it and try it. I mean, it's, it's probably not going to make you nauseous. There's a lot of, a lot of eh, I don't know about VR, but go and try it, because I, I was one of those people myself. And then I fell in love with the use cases and how it could be used in enterprise and also how we're going to be using it with communication and uh, training in the future. It's awesome. Yeah, and I think. Um you know, just like we talked about how some of the headsets were like $50,000 a few years ago, and now you can go all in for, well, if you're in the Oculus Go for two or 300 bucks, yeah. high end, you know, maybe 2K. And so we do expect those prices to drop pretty significantly. Um, but yeah, they're one of the first entrants. I think the haptic space is very yeah. exciting. Yeah. Tony, how about you? So I'm going to describe a little bit of a future view that I'm not sure it's been written about real well, but you want to know the future. So I've described the world of the kinetic today, and we do that pretty well. Uh, I'm very proud of where DoD is at. But more and more, I think that we're going to get into the non-kinetic aspects of conflict of wills, call it war, if you will, and higher echelons so that I would see our leaders in the future at the division commander level and it's funny we were talking about haptics because I think haptics are going to be part of this, where they have a haptic suit that they wear as part of their daily uniform where they can get sensations on different aspects of the battlefield, whether it's, hey, the economics in this potential uh, sector is going to a pot because we just destroyed the gas line, something like that. That can be done, I think, with data science, the things that we've heard discussed here in this conference, uh, AI and where, where we're going. So that is an expansion 
of the capabilities, but I also think that we're going to get higher fidelity yeah. so that modeling this room would probably take a really good guy to do it at high fidelity uh, a week. Sorry, that's really the answer. But with algorithms and data, maybe it could be done in a couple of milliseconds. That would dramatically change things, uh, and I think that we're there. Finally, uh, one thing that is not unique to DOD, but it's a little bit different, it's security. Everything that we do has got to have some kind of security behind it. The threat doesn't want to take my money, he doesn't want to influence my vote, he wants to kill me. So we tend to try to protect that, but try to run AR and VR distributed through an encryption device. It's painful, it doesn't work very well. We're starting to see now some things that are happening in the security field that will allow better distribution and better security simultaneously. That's huge, yeah, especially in the DoD space. Yeah. So, I'm, uh, so Maverick was founded with uh, kind of three goals. One is to imp increase the diversity of participants in the area, uh, working in AR and VR, um, to work on particularly simulation and training, um, and the future of media. Um, in thinking about how these technologies are being used and, and promoting them. Because we're actually a Department of Commerce funded thing, so our job is to create jobs, um, and not uh, through the university. Um, and it, what's interesting is, as I look at, there's this huge space in simulation and training. I, there's this huge space in operations. It's both military and enterprise. Um, and I think the enterprise is right at the cusp of being ready to, to kind of take off. One is the drop in costs. One is the availability of, of people who are capable of creating these things. And actually, there already are, there's already a program that I can run on my laptop where I can take photographs of this entire room and run it through, and it will automatically create the 3D model um, for that. And it does it in seconds. Um, <coughs> it's not good enough for the kinetic yet, but it's good enough for most other uses. Um, but what I, we've discovered in, in the one year that we've been operating is that and it, there's a whole lot we don't know yet. And so if you look at the predictions for how big VR will be, and a couple of years ago in the hype cycle, we were like, consumer VR is going to be $100 billion in two years now. Nobody believed that, no, except for some VCs who apparently th bought into it, like that was, there was no way that anybody was actually building the stuff, believed it. Um, but what it is ready for at this point is for people to bring it into their businesses um, and to bring it into their agencies. Um, and so we try to help people understand what the next five years looks like um, and then what does it look like past that. And the next five years, we're going to see a lot of augmented things. We're going to see, um, we have a HoloLens thing that we're doing with the University of, Balt uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore, where we take your sonogram information and overlay it on, via HoloLens on the doctor's view. So now the doctor isn't doing this <laughs> to see what's going on inside of you. They're looking at the leg or whatever, and they see, can see inside of it while they're looking at you. That means the doctor's not disengaged from the patient. That's, that's potentially enormous, so we're going to see a lot of enormous. But then the most exciting thing is if you look past the next couple of years and look at those predictions, there's about 66% of that $150 billion that we think it's going to be that says other. Other means we have no idea what it's going to be. And the reason we have no idea is because in VR, we are at the same place we were at in 2008 with these. Hey, that's really cool. I can get my email on, on the phone and, and do something. I don't know what else it's good for. Yeah. And we're kind of right there with VR right now. We don't know what else it's good for yet, but we have a huge number of people who are going to create that. And uh, a lot of them are here. Yeah. And so that's really exciting. Yeah, and you know, we still pay $900 for a phone. Yeah. So you know, <laughs> yeah. VR headsets, it's you know, $200. It's getting there. So. It's getting there, yeah. Uh, I think that's a really, really interesting point. The other is certainly exciting. Um, and you know, the price point, something we didn't mention earlier, is a lot of these phones now are having 
really impressive AR yeah. capabilities built into them. Yeah, they're, that. they're already in there. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a there's a it's, there's a hundred million AR capable phones yeah. on the planet already. Yeah. We don't, but other than Pokemon Go, nobody knows what to do with it yet, right? Yep. And Pokemon Go isn't really AR, but that's a different thing. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, I have run out of questions, so I'm gonna get over to the audience here. We've got some wandering mics running around. Uh, if you guys have any questions, please raise your hand. Sure. Paul Sizemore. Um, I just moved to DC. And um, something that I'm really interested in is um, using AR and supplementing it with AI. Um, like, and so the question I have for you is, you mentioned um, when technologies get sub-million dollar level, they become viable. And um, so when, when are we as developers going to get hardware, um, in your opinion, that where it will dynamically um, be able to create a 3D model of our environment, um, like, you know, sub-million dollar level? Um, or I like, can do it really well and do it quickly. Um, so I mean, I know there's a few things out yeah. on that, but like they're, I don't know. They're still, they're, they're like, still, they're still, they're still like quite pricey. Um, there's <clears throat> amazing 3D cameras that you can get as well to create environments, 3D environments. Um, but I, I mean, as a developer, I would, I would go and and do a little bit of research and see who out there is already doing, because uh, I don't have any current examples, but we work with uh, some companies that provide us with that type of content. So companies are doing it. They already have models. Um, but I mean, my best answer is just, you know, get on, get on the internet and see, see who's already doing it. There's, there's a lot of really great resources uh, for, I think it's Telegram. Uh, it's a big long word. I'm <laughs> it's escaping me right now, but uh, yeah, there are 3D model environment uh, softwares out there that are a little bit on the on the lower end. So, just a couple more things too. Um, you know, we mentioned the Hololens is going to have kind of that onboard neural network accelerator. Uh, Microsoft is, I think, actively taking applications right now for developers that want a beta version of that. Yeah. And so I think it's not supposed to ship until like the first half of next year, but I think the beta versions will ship, and you might be able to get your hands on that if you can put a convincing case. So reach out. Reach out to the hardware companies. They're yeah. giving dev kits all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. I believe it's a little bit outside the time to get the Magic Leap, but again, just go ahead, contact them, let them know what you're going to want to produce and what kind of content you want to produce. The Magic Leap especially is very supportive of content creators. So, yeah. I actually have a quick question about the ethics of VR. As uh, things become more and more realistic, um, I think it's really interesting that Mattis says that he wants to be able to fight 25 battles before they actually step out on the battlefield. But at what point, when that technology moves over to the civilian side for video games and that sort of thing, do we enter like a moral gray space? I'm curious about your thoughts on that. Didn't hear your last sentence. So like uh, when uh, Mattis talks about he yeah. wants to uh, right. do 25 battles before he steps onto the battlefield with troops, at what point when that technology migrates over to the civilian space, video games, other applications, does that become like a moral gray area and what your thoughts are? Yeah, so good question. Um, I am a parent, and I think that there's an awful lot of that kind of thing that has to take place to keep the technology separate. Uh, I don't think that it will ever be uh, scientifically possible to stop them from migrating, uh, but I really don't want criminals able to rob the bank 25 times before they you know, go do it for real. Um, I have to admit, I've never been asked that question before, uh, and that was a good one. I currently don't know how to stop the technology from getting misused. But um, I can't. So I see that as a danger, but from my perspective, DOD, the worth is uh, more significant than the danger. Good question. That's a very good question. Uh, from a, we actually do talk about that a lot. Um, uh, and actually, the keynote uh, is 
somebody, the, the former director from Magic Leap, uh, a former director from Magic Leap who's specifically going to talk about ethics. Um, but it is, um, it, it's important to remember it's an enabling technology and like any technology, there's gonna be good uses and bad uses. I think what's really important right now where we are is that we start getting ahead of that and start thinking about it. There's a lot of really interesting legal questions even about who owns things, especially with AR. So if I walk in here and I write something in AR on the wall, could the Atlantic or Booz Allen say, no, you have to take that down because this is our space and we own it, right? Or can I, what happens if that's on the sidewalk? Um, and so there's some really interesting ethical and legal questions that need to be answered and need to be, need to be considered right now, uh, even before we get to the specific use cases. Um, and I absolutely encourage that, that discussion and, and want to make sure that we are talking about it from a, both a policy standpoint and from a technical standpoint of what do we want to enable. I think we can learn something too from some of the recent technology trends like in the AI space we did see some instances where unconscious bias was being coded into algorithms you know and trained along those lines um, and so I think it's very important that we harness our lessons learned everything that we've learned you know over the past few years um, and you know incorporate that in a way that you know can be measured and controlled to a certain extent. So, other questions? Um, a variation on the theme and picking up on a comment you just made. Are, is there, are there any examples of civilian use, particularly law enforcement use of the training? Um, 25 bat bloodless battles when you're thinking about unarmed shootings, but also with regard to police officers or law enforcement first responders who might have a bias to a cer against a certain cohort in, in the community. Is there a way to use biometrics and use AI to determine, one, whether or not there is such bias, and two, either can be trained out, and if three, maybe they shouldn't be in that community if it can't be trained out? So I actually have a specific case of this. So we, at, at UMD, we are working with one of the local police departments um, in uh, built, built a 3D environment, produced the same content, um, same situation, same, same script with multiple uh, races uh, being the protagonist. And we are working with the police department. They're putting all of their officers through this training to uh, expose unconscious bias, right? Um, and so when you're presented with the same situation on a random, in a randomized trial basis um, with different protagonists, how does the officer react? And we're tracking pupil dilation and, pup uh, and eye tracking. Um, we could do respiration and heart rate. Um, I'm not sure if that's included in it, but they are absolutely doing that. Um, and we're not the only group that's, that's working on that. The Anti-Defamation League ha is working with uh, a number of people around the, around the world for that as well. Um, and then we're also doing, also doing things with fr firefighters for training, um, as, as you mentioned earlier. Um, there's quite a few groups working with that as well. We did a collaborative project with the Customs and Border Protection folks. Uh, they have a facility in West Virginia that they use for training, and they are very much doing uh, the kind of things that you talked about here. That, that's my experience in the area. I want to ask a question. Sure. Uh, if you're all the way in the sound of my voice, if you're a, a rabid VR headset user, raise your hand. OK, if you have used them and you kind of like them and maybe you, you have one, raise your hand. Sure. If you put them on a couple times, uh, but you're not quite there yet, uh, hands. And if you're here just to learn something uh, and you've never even put on a headset before, raise your hands. Yeah, that's a really good mix. Um, and that's, that's, you know, you mentioned it and that's what we're experiencing. But I got to tell you that I got more in the middle than I thought we were going to get there. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and, and so that actually makes you a really unusual audience yeah. um, because I, I speak to audiences of like rotary clubs and business groups uh, a lot. And about 80% of them have heard of VR and, but don't really know that what it stands for even, much less have tried it themselves. Um, we tend to live in our own little bubbles and think that everybody knows what we know. And so if we know it, we think everybody else does. But it, we're still right there at the beginning of this, of this technology. 
as well as the use of automatically and remotely controlled uh, heavy vehicles like tanks. So just because of the nature of my last job, I actually have an answer for you that I'm, it's a studied answer. Robotics are coming more and more. Um, their utility is growing. Pack animals, medics, whatever. Their lethality is growing. Drones, ground pounders, whatever. The DOD standard right now is that there will never be a lethal engagement of a robot without a human in the loop. Today, that's the standard. There is a growing list of people, though, and a growing number of folks that are challenging that, saying that given that a robot can potentially, or a smart weapon can potentially limit collateral damage and can execute quicker than a human and therefore prevent damage, is it immoral, and that's the word being used, is it immoral not to allow certain robots to execute on their own? That's not policy. Policy is there will always be a human, but it's being discussed. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Daniela Kiamrath is my name. Could you, could you um, make a classification of the industries that benefit the most of where we are right now with VR and AR? And also, Lucian, could you tell us how we find out more about your um, conference? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, sure. So I'll start with that. <laughs> Did you pay um, her? Yeah, I, yeah, I was going to say. I'll give you the 20 later. Um, uh, no. Uh, so the conference is in two weeks. It's October 17th and 18th at UMD. Um, Maverick.umd.edu. We'll give you more information. Would love to, love to have everybody there to learn more. It'll be two days of talking about t topics like this, including ethics. Um, and the technology and the enterprise use cases. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll yeah. defer the, the question about where the best uses are, although I certainly can opine. Yeah. <laughs> so our, our customers over at Doghead Simulations is anywhere from enterprise, from large enterprise, to uh, mostly education. So education and training, what I mean by that is uh, companies and education facilities will use our product beyond just meeting spaces. They have created entire classrooms and auditoriums to have their classes. We work with Full Sail University in Orlando, Florida, and they're currently teaching their game design classes inside of our software um, with anywhere from 10 to 30 uh, students at a time and an instructor. And they've been running this program for, the, I think, for like the last four or five months with great feedback. And we're, we're definitely learning a lot from the students and how that they're interacting. But so far, it's been extremely positive feedback. Um, and uh, I think one of the things with any kind of industry getting into VR is that um, the technology that they're using, the headsets, the laptops, um, most of them don't even know that they already have those resources. For example, with colleges and uh, education facilities, a lot of them already have technology partners with computer companies, and they don't realize that they can also get VR headsets through those companies. So. Uh, if you're in any kind of industry and you're a little bit interested in VR, look at those partnerships that you already currently have if you want to start being that evangelist and pushing it in your industries. Well, the mic's passing over. I just wanted to raise one point and kind of foot stomp a point that uh, Lucian made. You know, UMD is kind of taking a lead right now at saying, let's organize the DC, Northern Virginia, Maryland communities that are focused on AR, VR, you know, start to talk more. As much as we love going to Seattle and Austin and some of the other hotbeds, you know, we've got a lot of work that's happening in this area. And so I would really encourage you to take a look at Maverick and let's start getting organized, you know, around our area here and start sharing lessons learned. Because I think a lot of us are going to be working on the same problems. So, um, in other talks in this conference, the conversation has inevitably led to cybersecurity and how do we make different technology resilient. And 
It just occurred to me that I've never heard anyone discuss making AR, VR resilient, but if these tools are being used to train, especially our first responders, our warfighters, then we really don't want someone getting in there and reprogramming things to increase bias rather than decrease it. So have you come across in your work anything to make sure that the VR, AR systems can't be hacked either? So good question. Um, there's a couple things there. One, resiliency can also be hardware, software, um, durability. And I just want to say up front that I'm hearing a very healthy discussion in at least DOD saying we don't want to build these things so that they're invincible, we can't afford it. We need lightweight uh, devices, lightweight things, so if I break it, I can't get my phone out. I just throw it away. <laughs> I can get another. But that's not necessarily what you're talking about. Um, I don't know of any, but that was a good question. Um, the things that can be done with AI and uh, data science right now would lead me to believe it's possible, but I am not aware of any in DOD. So yeah, the, we've had a number of discussions about this. Yeah, the, there's, you know, resiliency can kind of manifest itself in different ways. One of the interesting spaces we're looking at, we talked about the convergence of AI and immersive coming together. Another um, theme that's happening right now is a convergence of kind of these cloud architecture, modern software development, and immersive coming together. And so, you know, the reason I bring that up is you look at a project that Google released recently called Agones. It's in partnership with Ubisoft. And it's really built off their Kubernetes platform, which powers the most intense workloads in the world. There's included a lot of the big, you know, dot coms use that clustering mechanism for scheduling. I think that is really critical um, because I think we would all acknowledge that immersive is not going to get anywhere without backend cloud support, you know, streaming data and, you know, providing that capability. So I think those projects are really interesting. Microsoft also just um, started a cloud gaming division where they took some of their best people from Xbox and some of their best people from their Azure cloud computing practice and have created this division. And so I think in terms of, you know, the resiliency of kind of the back end and the software, I think we're starting to see some progress there as well. I don't know if that's what you had in mind. Or... Yeah, uh, so a lot of the tools that are being used, like the game development tools for the artificial environment, are not, were not designed that way. Um, and so I've been talking with NASA, for example, and they're like, we can't use it because we can't install it because it requires these ports to be open and we can't put it on our secure networks. And, um, Johns Hopkins uh, Advanced Physics Laboratory had the same problem. They had to create a new subnet for their VR space uh, so that they couldn't, because it couldn't be commingled with any of the secure areas. Um, so there, it, it is being looked at from that perspective, and it's also being looked at from an ethical standpoint of if we get to the point where I am able to see things in the real world um, that aren't there. At some point, those are going to be so real that I have a hard time distinguishing between them. We already see people in the videos who are playing pool or looking at an, an engine, and they, they're wearing VR glasses, and they forget that there's not actually a table there, and so they fall on their face. Um, and so there, people have already started thinking about, well, how, OK, how do we make sure that people kind of know that distinction between the real and the not. And it's a design problem right now, but it's also going to be a, a technical problem. One thing, and by the way, one of the problems of setting up here is that we hear things for the first time, and we often don't have time to cogitate it, but this is one that I, I think I did. One thing that is happening that I'm pretty excited about from a resiliency perspective, and gets to your point about people mucking with the software, is that more and more DOD is understanding open source software is the way to go, and open source software is much more resilient than an EXE. For example, I didn't pay for software in the last five years I was in civil service. Just didn't do it. And my stuff worked much better and we came much faster uh, than anything I'd ever done with the, the big companies. So th mm, that's not intentionally being done to address what you were talking about, but it is happening. Okay. Time for one more? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, thinking back recently to uh, Mark Zuckerberg's testimony to a, a panel of U.S. Senate innovators, which, you know, kind of became fodder for, for late-night comedians, um, 
touching on the really crucial issues of ethics, laws, uh, liability, which you were just addressing, uh, what's being done now or what could be done to better engage by, by other branches of government, academe, industry, better engage, better educate, or start the process of better educating the legislative branch of government, because at some point, they are going to have to get involved to, you know, litigate on these issues of liability, ethics, laws. And if we wait too long and then we try to go back and get them to catch up, you know, they're, they're having a hard time with, with the technology of Facebook. And that's pretty simple stuff compared to what we're talking. So how, how, how are you? How can we reach out? I don't mean this to be belittling. They're an incredibly important part of our life, but, you know, how, how do we keep them up to speed? I think I, oh, yeah. I'll, I'll go ahead and then you can. Um, I think as a industry, and I'm talking about the VR industry and the AR, XR, whatever, um, industry as a whole, uh, we have a bit of a responsibility as pioneers and creating these new technologies to start working with the companies that have policies in place. I remember when social media first came out, it was like every company that I was working with was, I was like, do you have a social media policy? And they're like, what is that? Um, things weren't put into place. Those regulations weren't put into place yet. So right now, as we're producing these technologies, uh, I think it's up to us as the creators and also on the, the end of the, the users to start that process and making those, you know, and those regulations and security and ethics as well. Um, so we, ha we still have a little bit of work to do with, with that definitely because it, there's, again, like that was, that was a great point that you brought up about, you know, where are the loopholes? And these are, these are things that maybe we haven't thought about yet. So um, progressing it to a higher level to, to government would be fantastic. Um, but again, I saw the Facebook uh, trial and even you know, trying to explain Facebook was a little difficult. Yeah. Um, so I can only imagine trying to explain you know, why a haptic suit you know, did this or that, or why an AR or VR, why something happened. So I, I believe that we have a bit of a responsibility as an industry to start creating those regulations and passing it up and educate, like get pe more people in VR headsets and get them introduced to what the technology actually is. Yeah, I think those are really good points. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you guys know of anything in the region. I, I know that there has been some interest at the congressional level around this, and I know that uh, Facebook has stood up uh, a team here of public policy um, experts who are also versed in immersive technologies to try to start that narrative and start that discussion. Um, uh, you know, I think that that's probably an area that we just have to monitor and, and as practitioners, you know, take it seriously and be advocates of it. Yeah, the, the, it, really important to what I used to do, I guess, but I'm going to go back to something that you heard here on the stage yesterday with Susan Kelwhite from NGA. I was thrilled to hear her say that. She said that they are writing tradecraft into the algorithms that the intelligence community is using. Just right. So what we need to do on everything from basic simulations to AR to VR to data science is to ensure that our algorithms reflect our national ethics and our national morality. We can't allow it merely to be a zero and one most efficient. No. It has to reflect our morality. Uh, and I think there's a lot of safety there, even if policymakers don't quite understand something, if they are assured and open source software can demonstrate that morality is being built into the code from the beginning, um, that's what separates us from our competitors, and I just think it's valuable. Cool. All right, well, I think we are uh, at time, so what we'll do is we'll, we'll hang out here by the stage for a while if you guys have any other questions. Just a few things. I mean, obviously, these are industry luminaries. You know, they are deep in the technology and, um, you know, are, are certainly thought leaders. So follow them on social media. You can find their information in the app. 
We also have a few VR demos in the back. So um, if you are steeped in VR and you play Beat Saber and Skyrim and all that fun stuff and you want to see what we're doing for some of our military clients, uh, it's pretty cool. I would go take a look at it because it certainly um, opens up some realms of possibility. Uh, with that, I just want to thank all you guys for coming, especially at your lunch hour, and hope you enjoy the festival. And thanks again for your time. Thank you. Thank you.